think you know the beauty of Africa in its safaris and wilderness. But do you see a continent marching on the road of new industrialization? You're familiar with the notion of a rapid growing Chinese economy, but are you aware of the Asian giant's aspirations to become a technological innovator? Both Africa and China find themselves at a critical moment of transformation. Is more substantial cooperation needed for better development? And how can the two join hands to overcome obstacles on their respective paths? Dialogue on CGTN travels to South Africa to seek the answers. We offer you a feast of ideas and wisdom with Jay Smith, a senior South African diplomat dealing with Chinese affairs, Professor Kenneth Ozoemena, a Nigerian scientist working on energy development, Iju Wang, once the youngest member of parliament in South Africa, and Dr. Paul Zilungisela Tembe, a China-Africa studies professor who speaks excellent Mandarin. Come and join this dialogue with the world special in collaboration with the South African Broadcasting Corporation in Cape Town, South Africa, only on CGTN. Hello and welcome to Cape Town in South Africa. And it's from here that we are going to bring you a special broadcast between the South African Broadcasting Corporation and the China Global Television Network, CGTN. I'm Peter Ndora and it's really an honor and a pleasure to be one of your hosts on the program today. And what we'll be doing is uh, taking a look at some of the important issues of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Now, the summit that was held in Johannesburg in 2015 under the theme China-Africa progressing together, win-win cooperation for common development was all about consolidating the solidarity and cooperation amongst the peoples of China and Africa. In many ways, the Beijing summit of 2018 continues with that journey, but only it happens under the auspices of the fourth industrial revolution, and that's laden with uh, uh, innovations and uh, new technologies. Um, but what does all of this mean, uh, this new industrialization mean for Africa and China? We're going to be ex exploring that on the program, but I'm not alone. I'm joined by the regular host of uh, the dialogue and CGTN, Hi, Wan Ray. <laughs> Welcome to South Africa. Feels so good, yeah. <laughs> now, I know you've got some great scenes in China. I've seen some of them as well, but tell me what you think about Cape Town and this majestic table mountain. Look, Peter, <laughs> all options are on the table. <laughs> For the table mountain does serve as a beautiful backdrop against which we are here to host a very meaningful dialogue yes. on the future that we share with Africans, mm -hmm. right? So we are also blessed by the severity of the winter here in South Africa and your warm <laughs> friendship as well. Hi, welcome to Dialogue with Africa. I'm Yang Ri, hosting this special program in Cape Town in partnership with Peter Ndoro and South Africa's SABC. China and Africa see each other as a huge opportunity in seeking full prosperity through the Belt and Road Initiative. But will the current trade war with the United States impact Africa? How do Africans see trade protectionism and digital globalization, Peter. Mm. Well, you know what? Let's sit down, introduce our guests, and try and figure this out. And uh, so, let's start with your side. Who, who have you got next to you? I'm honored to be joined on this side by okay. Professor Kenneth uh, Ozo Amina with Wits University in Johannesburg. And next to him is a, a young member of the South African Parliament. He is also a member of ANC. Welcome to our special program, Dialogue with Africa. Thank you. All right, and helping us with this discussion, I'm going to introduce uh, right next to me uh, Professor Paul Tembe, who's an associate professor at the Institute of African Studies at Zhejiang Normal University. Thanks very much for joining us. You're also a research fellow at the Tabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. You. Next to you, uh, Shay Smith, a senior international trade manager, uh, Asia and uh, the development agency Westgrow, trade investment and tourism, big on your agenda. Let me start with you, uh, uh, Paul, and I'm, I'm just wondering, because a lot of our audiences in South Africa in particular, I know, have never heard of FOCAC, and it's another one of those summits that these peoples of Africa and peoples of China come together. Why is this one important? What value does it add in your view? Uh, let me start by FOCAC. FOCAC is a coherent arm 
that is to synergize and synthesize the all bilateral relations of African countries vis-a-vis -vis China as the, as the power of today. Uh, what FOCAC helps us with, it helps us to streamline all the legs of uh, bilateral relations and cooperation between Africa and China. And it started with uh, the mineral resources, it went to industrialization, agricultural modernization, in which the two are going to be the theme of this year's FOCAC. But uh, added into that, it will be the digitization. As you've mentioned, the fourth industrial revolution. We cannot have the fourth industrial revolution without digitization. And African growth is going to see us having a huge leap into urbanization. And that also calls for technology and digitization. And now, FOCAC is about to synthesize this platform and showing us the way, how, from where do we move forward from this moment in time. Uh, our friends on this side, have drawn a rosy picture about the forecast. But do you think we are also facing multiple challenges in our collaboration with Africans and indeed the African Union when we shape our own course of development? We have a, uh, uh, it, it, it's good that we already have the forecast. Uh, the, the, there isn't much problem at the moment. The, 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 uh, as the first uh, uh, speaker already mentioned, there is a, a, a need for us now to move to real industrial uh, revolution. We are already in it. We, we cannot run away from that now. That's where we are, but uh, there is a need for us now to bring Africa at par with what the industrial revolution is going to bring about. And I, I, I hope that as we continue with this discussion, we're going to you know, expound on, on, on the challenges and the, uh, and the opportunities we should be looking at. First and foremost, I'm afraid we have the image problem about China. Well, you are a rainbow country. China is often portrayed as a panda or a dragon. Now, what kind of image does China go down history? Uh, I, think, I think if I may add um, this thing, uh, Fokak is not only a platform. I mean, also China's um, uh, image of growing uh, presence in Africa and globally um, is more than um, just one single um, action. It's it's that forecast and various um, um, Chinese um, um, involvements uh, globally. It's a commitment from China um, in globalization, global village, and human race uh, as a unity, um, which is very different uh, from what um, what the U.S. is busy doing now. Um, I mean. Traditionally, I mean, Africa has been mostly sidelined um, by, by Western interests, particularly on, um, um, if you look at where um, U.S. Um, what U.S. doing now um, is creating trade wars and, and, and creating unilateralism. That's not something what we, we look for. If you look at Foucault, um its, its mission, its mandate, its, its purpose, it's, it's definitely um, a, a more a unified approach. Um, to, to raise the, the interest of general general um, public and any any um, um, for for the better better life of um, all. Well, all Jay, uh, a few years ago, the BBC delivered a documentary called "China is Back." But is China a threat or a friend? It certainly, is a friend. It's a collaborative friend. It's a friend that really aims to seek a win-win solution. Win-win was never a verb that I grew up with or knew about. And it's really imparted something on us to say, what does China mean by win-win? And what do we understand by win-win? I don't think threat is something we want to say is, is what China offers us. We're certainly not seeing that. We're seeing collaboration and we're seeing mutual beneficiation for the two, for the country and for the continent. I think what's critical is is the threat being perceived from an economic, development, environmental? And these are the things I'm hoping FOCAC is going to look at. What is it that this time, as we go into this new world, when there is trade wars going on, how are we, as Africa and China, going to balance and realign this international trade system for the benefit of both our people? And if we start to see each other as threats, I don't think we're going to be able to balance that, that kind of development or socio-economic development. And I just wonder, because there's a perception with many Africans that China actually might be a Trojan horse, a colonialist power that's coming 
steal our minerals and um, give us a few gifts in the process. Mm. What's your experience of that relationship? And, and, and I suppose couch it in a way that we can understand on the continent what China is trying to do. What, what I've learned from the West is like you have to mimic a ready-made system. You can only achieve modernity if you follow how the West is. But what I've discovered with almost two decades of uh, dealing with China, studying in China and coming back to Africa, I sort of, I want to take the, the statement win-win situation a level higher. I've experienced a multi-civilizational dialogue which has been brought by China. This is a big word because it means China is cognizant that Africa has got its own civilization as well. So it allows these two civilizations to have some sort of synergy in order to move forward. That's why the theme of uh, the BRICS, the Forum for Human Rights that has passed and there's one coming next month, the main thing has been prosperity for mankind. And that is the, what the approach that China is bringing up. Now, if you take another initiative like a One Belt Initiative, One Belt Initiative also, it is a unifying initiative. It's not China sitting at the helm and telling everybody what to do. Everybody contributes to the melting pot of humanity. And now, if we go to the trade war, that is my colleague mentioned. Can I, can I humbly take over your point on the trade war? Yes. In fact, the United States, particularly its media, sees the current trade war as a battle for primacy of digital technology. China, on the other hand, says, well, the Belt and Road Initiative aims to build interconnectivity through digital technology. Our friends in South Africa also say, look, Yang Rui, digital technology may help us uh, develop in, uh, through fraud leaps uh, to have a corner overtaking. Do you think this is an easy job? No, you know, the trade war is a, uh, it is a war, and when war, nobody wins in any war. That's the first thing. It's going to hurt the U.S., it's going to hurt uh, China, but the people that will be hurt more will be the emerging markets, mainly Africa and other emerging markets. So um, <clears throat> I, I think it is, it is important to, it's very critical to stop this uh, war going on. Uh, at, the, at the moment, uh, last week I was, uh, I was happy to learn that um, uh, there is a, 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 a dialogue now going on between U.S. and the China negotiators uh, that says, well, maybe Donald Trump and the, uh, and, and the SMGP will, will, will meet sometime this year, around November. And, and you see what has happened to the market. And uh, the market never likes uh, uncertainty. It, it, it's, it, when there is certainty and then people market grows, but when there is none, everything changes. So, Look, gentlemen, everybody in China is talking about the benefits of uh, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, which is the Chinese equivalent of Google, the search engine. However, as a scientist, and uh, every fellow guest speaker here, would you voice your concerns about the alleged double-edged sword of digital technology? Will it violate our privacy? or in, instead it will promote the transparency. Do you think the younger generation in South Africa, Chris, will seize this opportunity and grow up very quickly in closing the gap between China and Africa economically? I admit that um, um, the U.S. has been advanced in terms of technology. Being, um, China is following suit. Um, and the fact that Chinese um, um, technology and digital advances, it's, it's getting a fast pace which is beneficial to us um, because we get the best um, um, at affordable price because we understand um, if we go particularly going to rural areas the government um, in Africa has been doing a lot to bring the digital divide and that's what we need we've got an infrastructure deficit in Africa and that's mm -hmm. what we need to bring up the space uh, with, the, with the talk of the fourth industrial revolution and the, four, the, the question of cyber development mm -hmm. and privacy, I think if we should look at the benefits of technology, what technology can bring us. Now, within the broader scheme of words, what technology is teaching us, it teaches us that we can go down and unlock old systems 
and get rid of this redundant all the type of education, redundant all the type of production, centralized conveyor belt, second industrial revolution type of, of production. We see a situation whereby our youngsters can leapfrog in their development and education whereby we've got Baidu, we've got YouTube, knowledge is there at the, at the tip of your, uh, of, your this thing, of your fingers. So what we need to do is to fast track the putting of cable, to fast track the accessibility of the ICT facility. I'm afraid one of the problems that get featured prominently in the local media is unemployment rate, which mm -hmm. is put at, at perhaps 40% in South Africa. Do you think digital technology will help solve the problem of joblessness, or do you think you'd rather tend to labor-intensive and low-value-added manufacturing the China shifts from our continent to, South, to Africa? as the groundwork for reindustrialization or economic takeoff. Right, yeah. I think you've really hit the, the key element here. How do we balance industrialization and the industrial revolution of 4.0? And how do we leapfrog? We all talk about leapfrogging, but how do we do this? So on one end, we need to industrialize. And I think this is where it's critical. The Forum on China Africa Cooperation has funds available for our industrialization. So they are supporting us to industrialize. The main reason behind that is for two reasons. We need to create jobs, we need to grow our economy. And the African economy is growing. So I don't think China is investing in Africa thinking I'm just putting money into a pot. They really see the development. But we're also looking at the technological evolution. Jack Ma was here a couple of weeks ago. And it was fascinating for him to see us as someone who didn't know about Africa. I mean, Jack Ma, Alibaba, international. He admitted to say, I need to come and understand more about what's going on in Africa. And I think this is the core about Forum on China Africa. It is how do we manage to understand each other? The ideas of threats, the ideas of Trojan horses, these are all, it's misinformation or media that is, has its own agenda. But this opportunity that we have to engage is critical because once the Chinese come, they love South Africa, they love Africa. What we've done in the Western Cape is we've positioned ourselves to start to look at industrialization and the advancement of technology in terms of digitalization. So we're hitting this on a two-pronged approach. And I think the difficulty is, is for the Chinese, where do we really go? Do we go industrializing? or do I invest in the digitalizer? And, and you've, you've raised an interesting point and a concern for me is that you have China, one country, Africa, 54 states. Yes. And so the question is, how do we do this cooperation? We're at different rates of progress on the yes. continent. When we talk about digitization, some of our countries are struggling just to get electricity. How do we do this cooperation? Does China have to have 54 different relationships? That's a good question, you know, and the African well, continent. This is the role yes. of the African Union that we should perform the job yes. that should provide the Africans with the opportunities through inter-regional coordination. We have that ability to understand that. We want a consensus driven approach. And you're very correct, the development is very different. So we have a, a 2063 agenda. We all know where we want to be. We've agreed on the principles of how we want to do that. It is now critical for the African Union and the regional bodies in the negotiations with China to make sure development is equal on the continent. And that is going to be critical. Are we going to be interest-based as countries when we engage with China? Or are we going to be as a continent based on how do we advance as a continent with China? And I think that's going to be critical for us. The concerns we would certainly have is if China starts to develop some areas faster than other areas for her own economic interests. What I mean by that is we are a market. We're almost a billion in our market. So we have a consumer growth, middle-aged income starting to increase. But Chair, I think you forgot that just because China is a third party in this pocket war, one of the hosts, it's also a conducive, actually a very good idea for China to come in as sort of as a mediator to work amongst our African unions, because um, our, our, our African brothers and, and all have their own different interests in, or geographically different as well. 
but China as a third party actually is best suited to liaise and unite this particular, have a joint, uh, a joint mentor, a joint um, purpose going forward. I want to you know, say something about uh, what my colleague here said uh, uh, around the, the fourth industrial revolution, about the job and the threats. Remember that there is a, whenever there is a revolution, there is bound to be disruption. It has happened from time to time. Uh, every revolution will bring disruption, and those disru disruptions are bound to bring to create even more jobs. You, you know, think about what happened to the, even the Uber we are having today. How people have people are now creating their own jobs. People are having many businesses. So. We shouldn't see the, the fourth industrial revolution as a, it's something that is going to cause lo job losses and that. We should also look at it. It's going to create jobs that are highly skilled, more paying job, decent, more decent jobs. And, and I think that is where we should be looking at the fourth industrial revolution. It is here and we're not going to run away from that. Uh, we see what cell phone has done. To, to the world, to Africa, as, as, a, as an example. Remember when we used to have our landlines and that. Check what cell phone has done. Now we can do business in a very different way. Even local people who have no access to, who never had access to anything, can now have access to doing business, electricity. We in South Africa, for example, because we don't say we may not see the, the problem of electricity in South Africa. But when you go to other parts of Africa, you understand what we are talking about electricity. People are now using cell phones to conduct businesses, powerful businesses around, creating jobs. And uh, I, I think that's a issue is exciting, and we have to encourage our our youth to, to Chris, that level. Yeah. Uh, I just, go ahead. Yeah, I want to bring in Chris because what I like about Chris is, uh, and we've described him as an African Chinese or Chinese African, and maybe there's something there about understanding our cultures and the differences between the two. Because on, in Africa, and maybe I'm stereotyping a little bit, but where I've traveled, uh, one of the journeys that uh, we have to have is, you said that uh, China, we're not arrogant, we're, we're here to help. But there is a perception by many Africans that, hang on, we actually have to operate by China's rules. This relationship actually is almost prepared for us by China. And also that China comes in uh, with cheap goods and that compromises our own growth, our own industries. How do we manage the cultures? Because I'm hearing Wan Ray say one thing, but maybe perceptually out there, people are feeling something different. Let me start with you, uh, uh, Chris. Yeah, Peter, um, I think because my background, you know, of you know, being South African and being um, of Chinese descent, Chinese origin, um, if you look at China's um, history with Africa, go back to Ming Dynasty. Um, when I was in Parliament, um, I think in 2005 and 6, we had a display, a large display of um, a map of um, Africa drawn up by, by back then by, by the Chinese um, um, Voyager. Um, you'll see in the last couple of um, um, hundred years, China's interest in Africa is more in trade, which is more, more about mutually um, beneficial um, and activities. And peace and, and we send metal teams to yeah. help our brothers and sisters There was no here. colonial um, uh, activities, um, uh, nothing sort of that. In the recent years, um, because China has been a manufacturing powerhouse, yes. similar with what Japan did, a couple of years ago, Japan was sending cheap goods to the U.S. Um, China started just shipping cheap goods in, in Africa or because of the demand. Um, but now you can see um, this is a natural progress of a country, of industrialization. Um, now China has now up from cheap goods to, to much better um, um, or advanced technology and better, better product, and which is what we are benefiting right now. Um, this is what we call the process of a low carbon It's development. a process. Mm -hmm. yes. Green GDP so I well. wouldn't say um, um, the stereotyping was there. Um, yeah. I recall when I grew up in, in, in Cape Town in school, um, if uh, there was station was broken and my teacher would say, ah, those was made in China. You know, everyone yeah. was laughed and laughing. Yeah. But that was, a, that was um, uh, uh, um, true. There were definitely some cheap products that was not uh, up to the quality. But now you see, as, as we progress, as um, as the two countries work together, particularly with CSR, it was DTI, it was various departments, 
in South Africa and also with other African countries, we can see a lot of manufacturing capacity and yeah. skill transfer are happening in Africa. And that's what we need yeah, in this Africa. This is all happening at a high level, actually. Let but the ordinary man in the street... Let, 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 us, let, us, let us not confuse business with politics. Okay. The ordinary man in the street knows that China likes Africa and that Africa has got very good relationships with China. We've passed that, we've passed that romance, we've passed the courtship stage. Yeah. Now, this is business, and business says, first, China, uh, Africa must have intra-trade. We cannot expect China to be the helm of developing Africa. Africa must open its borders first, that's number one. Africa must up, up its intra-trade, that's number one. Number two, accept that you are not equally endowed, whether it be human resources or natural resources. So even the rollout of the fourth industrial revolution is going to be at different stages for different countries. Thirdly, China itself has accepted this. That is why China has, got, has chosen some countries as pilot countries for China. Not because China favors this country, it's, it's because China is aware of different speci specifics. There are benefits in dealing with Ethiopia because of Ethiopia's specificities. There are benefits in dealing with South Africa and other countries of this thing. So business is business. When it's feasible to do business, let's do business and focus on that. Now, what we are saying is that how can we speed up this cooperation of FOCAC and create strong pillars that will sustain Africa-China relations. Not for Africa-China relations in isolation, remember, for the greater part of humanity. That's what China is here for. Well, I would rather uh, raise a follow-up question about democracy. In the wake of the Cold War, most African countries have been transformed into democracy which is supposed to be very helpful in engineering economic success. But what we saw in some of the countries, I would rather not mention those names, uh, was actually disaster, economic chaos. Governance is the critical and key, if not catchphrase in our vocabulary, about the success of the economy. There are so many inspirations we can draw from, uh, uh, you know, from the past and, and to the present. Nothing is static. Uh, we, 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 we look at, for example, the, the issue of infrastructure, you, you, you know, in, infrastructure is the most important problem in, in Africa, the, you know, whether we're talking about fourth industrial revolution or how the business will run, how to leapfrog anything. If we don't have infrastructure, you know, nothing is going to happen. And I think that is what um, uh, my colleague already had mentioned, the other countries. I know in Nigeria, for example, they, they, they have the, the, the Lakey Free Trade Zone. And uh, it was a pilot uh, uh, scheme. Uh, and uh, I think it, it is, uh, uh, they can learn from, from the mistakes of, 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 of that pilot uh, scheme. And uh, of, of course, those, those uh, mistakes or, or challenges are out there. You can read them in the literature. They talk about I, 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 you know, planning, I, I, you know, inadequate planning. The, the most important one happens to be the infrastructure. They never knew about this. They never knew about access to roads. There is poor transport uh, 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 issue. They, 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 never, they never knew about um, uh, uh, for electricity generation, how can you work? How can you deal with any of these businesses we are talking about without electricity or good road network? The advantages yeah. that have been institutionalized in China, for example, could be ruled by decree. When you look at the issue of infrastructure building, you have to have easy solution to the use of land. But in your country, I'm afraid, you have different lobby groups interest groups, the political forces in the parliament who argue for the protection of farmers' interests. I'm not saying the Communist Party of China does not aim to protect the interests of the Chinese farmers. In your country, it's days and months and years of discussion and consultation. It takes time, right? So in this particular area, I see a big 
sea difference between sea by uh, 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 rule by decree and democratic consultation, parliamentary debates for days and months. So what do you think of the differences regarding uh, efficiency? I think uh, before we even go there, what are we ultimately looking for as a humanity? Is it not an equal platform to trade? Is it not an equal platform to develop? Mm -hmm. Whether we have a democracy, whether we have a communist state, whether we have a semi-communist state, I think the critical aspect is let the people decide how they want to engage in the international arena on an equal platform. This is the critical thing I want to see coming out of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Let us ensure that our trade can be on an equal footing. Now, I'm very honored to see the Chinese are already reducing their import tariffs. So President Xi's commitment to opening up the economy is being witnessed within a space of five years. And usually this takes quite a long time. So in December we see already a lot of the import duties coming off, which means Africans can trade now at a reduced rate. Secondly, we've got the China International Import Expo that President Xi is hosting in November. This is a wonderful opportunity because you're allowing South Africa, which is going to be the guest host country, to be in a platform that can now showcase their products to the Chinese community. Then when we talk about these high-level discussions of governments, allow the people to decide how they want, whether they want a democracy or not. But once we interact with each other, we'll start to realize you do have some good aspects and we have some good aspects. So how do we bring it all together to make an equal platform on the international That's arena? That's an interesting question, and Paul, I want you to answer this yes. as well. But yes. I, want, I want to ask you, because yes. I'm, I'm hearing Young Ray here yes. talk about the differences in Chinese governance and mm. the West. Yes. Are we kind of feeling the pressure, and I see it from time to time, yes. where African countries have to start to decide which side they're on? Are they yes. going west? Are they going east? Yes. Or can we do both? Let me use uh, the, the phrase I love using nowadays. Let me paraphrase your question. Up, yes. For it might be difficult for major political forces in your parliament to build consensus given yes. the seat differences between the trade union, the Communist Party yes. and ANC. Yes. But in China, yes. President Xi Jinping's voice is respected yes. Yes. the country over. In your yes. country, it's a very different case. Let, let me just put this on the table. Now I'm talking now to... Now table mountain. Yes. <laughs> now it can be as well be on the table mountain for all African presidents to see it. Maybe it's high time we spoke to the elephant in the room. Africa is reading from the old book. Africa refuses to let go the red tape of the old. Africa creates its industry and its laws based on the old book which was meant to serve a specific time in history and we've gone far past the time. Let me take one thing which is hailed as the paragon of South Africa, South African Bureau of Standards. South African Bureau of Standards is beautiful. We all adhere to it. But South African Bureau of Standards is drawn at the level of the first world. It means we cannot have inventions or innovations in South Africa because we are not allowed to make mistakes. So at the end, what is allowed is that what comes from outside, from the West mostly. For example, my colleague there, you mentioned that Chinese goods were referred to as Hong Kongs long ago. But nobody speaks of that today. Today we hail at uh, Chinese quality. Why? Because China had the learning curve. They set the standards low at the beginning in order for them to create innovations. You cannot create innovation if you ignore your own local conditions. So we are reading from the old book. That's number one. Number two, there is a, dis a discrepancy in China-Africa relations simply because China has got long-term planning and Africa has got short-term planning. Now, here's my question. How long will China pour money for investments when our policies are never 
they never become legislators. The question has made us jobless. Yes. We've lost our job. Very good question. So, yeah. the, it's, it's, it's always, it's always yeah. like short policies that can be changed by the next minister yeah. after four years or that can be changed by the, by the DDG or a DG. There's no long-term planning because policies are not into legislature. Let me take incentive policy, investment incentive policy. Investment incentive policy in South Africa, we make it sound big, but there's only one line in, in our law about incentive policy. There is no elaborate incentive policy. There, there's books on incentive policies but in the law of South Africa, there's only one sentence, which says nothing actually. Paul, here's the thing you're doing, and this is the question I raised earlier. Yeah. You're talking about South Africa. Ken can talk about Nigeria. Yeah. China only needs to talk about China. How do we, and this is, I guess, where you're talking about the Comeses, the eight African unions, because we actually have to find a, a common position on these issues. It can't be just South Africa needs this, West Coast needs this. How do we get the continent to behave almost in the same way as China is able to do by being one country? Deng Xiaoping was the architect yeah. of the modernization drive since uh, 1978, 40 years ago. This year witnesses the 40th anniversary of our opening up and reform. Now, the issue, I'm afraid, is uh, whether you guys in South Africa can create the strong feeling and impression that the latest policy move by the newly elected president would avoid a repeat of the land reform in your neighboring country of Zimbabwe because that will cause an uproar in public debates as to the future of South Africa. Whether you follow the suit of Mr. Robert Mugabe in depriving the whites of their land, I know you guys have a lot to say about the, the issue of equality uh, following the end of apartheid in 1949, but people around the world just look closely at the net marriage economic performance in Zimbabwe. That's why Mr. Robert Mugabe was uh, ousted for re-election. Do you have a solution that can persuade the rest of the world, look, you are very careful in not repeating the mistakes in Zimbabwe? Um, I think, well... I mean, I the Western media is very critical yes. of Zimbabwe. China keeps a neutral position about whatever the internal affairs. Let me make that very clear and clarify this situation. I think this land issues at everybody's heart. I mean, um, land security is important, um, but if you look at Zimbabwe, the uh, situation was, was different. Um, I mean, they had a legacy issue, and, and it, after the UK stopped um, supporting them, obviously all hell went loose. But from inside, particularly, it's, it's a different uh, scenario. Um, we, um, the ruling party, the governing party, has ensured um, it's that the, the land reform is not going to be turn out to be a land uh, land grab. I think that's what it, what's important. People must um, everyone must now go into the actual clause or the actual uh, discussion within this land debate and not just supervise uh, superficially looking at the uh, the short sentence. I think that was uh, created that the um, the chaos thinking that we um, SA is going to move um, uh, towards that direction. I don't think um, um, I don't think it's going to happen. No, it's not gonna um, and also, if you look at General development. It's about resources. I mean, Paul also mentioned um, China. We, China is one country, and Africa is 54 states. Um, um, it's it's about getting people people together. Look at the resources and spend. I mean, China has great solutions, but China is not the solution. Um, I mean, with a trade war, China um, has definitely been dented with a lot of resources that would have otherwise be able to assist other countries in terms of globalization. Um, and with um, what Shay mentioned, um, the, the China, the first China in, in import and export uh, market, it shows Chinese um, um, commitment for, for opening up their domestic demand economy to other countries. Particularly, we should take Focus should take this opportunity because this is probably the first time in history, in Chinese history, that a government level um, uh, import export um, um, uh, targeted at the Chinese domestic market, allowing us to export our goods and services. And that's what Africa should be good at. We should focus on our agro, agro, uh, agro business and value add and start exporting some of our base, well not necessarily some of us products or some of our services going that side in exchange um, for, for our benefits or for, for our other um, uh, you know, human resource capital, for our uh, infrastructure goals here. All these things are, are, are need, need to be planned under a budgetary constraint. 
which everyone suffers. I think um, in a global economy right now, not only China has a problem, we also have a problem. I think that I think that's a cross board. Will, will our friends in Africa take a closer look at the lessons and the inspirations of China's economic reform? By the way, the reform itself remains pretty controversial when we review the whole decade. Now, China actually, the Communist Party of China took over power in 1949 through land reform and through an introduction of the controversial sense of egalitarianism. That's the utopian dream that our first generation of the leadership introduced. When we decided to open up China, we also did it through the land reform, through the reform in the agricultural areas. Now, land reform has become a very important catchphrase in our vocabulary in defining the alleged success of China's economic reform and our modest uh, governmental reshuffling. So what can I hear from our African friends about the land reform in Africa, in South Africa in particular? <laughs> L land reform you guys seem to be tight-lipped about this. No, it's because, it's because we are sitting in the middle of it. In the middle of it? It's, it's hard to scream when you are in the boiling pot, <laughs> so to speak. Land reform, it has got to be solved, but it has to be solved in an orderly way. It has to be solved in, in a way that benefits the country, not in a destructive way. I, I spoke about policies and law. So land reform has to take the process of the law. If we become populists about issues of land reform, we are going to create chaos that is going to take is us that a back matter, in history. Excuse me, is that a matter of law or politics? Is that about the elections? Is and the politicians raise the issue to appeal to the mind and the heart of the poverty-stricken population. I, I, for me, I think it is a bit of both. Uh, but uh, we have to understand the, that South Africa is not going to go the way of Zimbabwe. Let's, I think we have to understand that. And I don't think they, that is what the ruling party is doing. Um, from, from what I've read and from what I've heard, uh, land reform should be... There should be, there is a, a, a greater need for land reform. Uh, you said that uh, of China. In, in Nigeria, I remember when we have, I think it's still in the law of Nigeria, where we have what they call land use decree. That land use, use decree was done so many years, that 1979 or so. Every land belongs to the government. That's the, that is the bottom line. If, if the government sees, if finds something in your land, if, where you build your house, the, the government has a right to take it and compensate you. And but again, South Africa has got a very different, a, a very different uh, scenario because of the, 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 the evils of apartheid. But I, I believe that land reform has to be done, but it has to be done uh, as the law requires it to be done. Okay. It has to be done in yeah. such a way that people will, will, will yeah. is not going to destroy what we have built over the years. All right. Here's my fear. Uh, we can speak and talk at quite a high level technical mm. issues and and I'm thinking about uh, Kofi Mensa in Ghana mm. um, Abel Mwale in mm. Kenya mm. Jabusu Tole in South Africa Wu Yen in China um, Rita Ko in China and they're sitting watching this they said we've heard about FOCAC and this China-Africa cooperation. But what they're saying to themselves is, how is my life going to be better tomorrow as a result of all of these amazing discussions you're having? And I want to know, because I'm watching this on TV now, and I'm like, this is such a great conversation, but And if I were to gonna... ask you your question, yes. I would not <laughs> simply repeat your uh, question. I would say the issue is whether we can live and let live to introduce uh, more cultural diversity, to deliver broad tolerance for uh, something that might be irrelevant to your own culture, your own political institutions that might work for our country. So is that an issue of a live and a let live? Peter, I think that the question is critical. And what we're asking ourselves is, is how do we plug into the high level dialogue? So the critical thing to realize is there's an action plan. When the summit is over, there are various sectors, various categories that are identified with very clear or, or ways that we can move forward. 
What we need to do as both academics, uh, in the political, in the legal, in the trade, is unpack those, work with stakeholders, which means it's not government driven, it's business driven or sector driven, to ensure we get the benefits. Now, it certainly worries us that people don't understand about what FOCAC is all about. And I think this is critical. We need to continue engaging, not only from a China-Africa perspective, but an Africa perspective. We meet at the African Union. Let us talk openly and frankly about the citizens of Africa. Just to go back to land reform, I think the critical question I ask myself is why does Africa look for land reform? Why did China first start with land reform? It was a route to economic emancipation. This is the critical factor we must look at. And, of the mind. and how does China assist Africa to emancipate economically? And I think this is something I'm looking forward to in the focus. There is an agricultural fund. I think it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's significant in terms of its billions. But I'd like to see a little bit more because that is where we're looking at. We're looking at the emancipation from the land. And I think this is, for me, very critical. And then we're going to talk to your question, Peter, of are the people on the ground going to understand the benefits of FOCA? And my last point is education. This kind of interaction that we're having is critical. It gets people to go to the web page, type in FOCA, and start to read about the opportunities that exist for you. Come to your government and say, I saw Shay on TV. How can I go and get access to funding? How do I go to China and take my product to China so that the Chinese consumer understands there is quality product? Shay, I'm glad Africa. you put your finger on a very interesting issue of emancipation. It's mm. either emancipation of the mind or emancipation of people from poverty by the year 2020. Mm. That's a vision and blueprint of President Xi Jinping. Correct. But when we look at emancipation of people from poverty, it means how to use public spending. When we want to live people in their millions out of poverty in two years, it's, it has a lot to do with liquidity, funds. And there are critical voices as to why the Chinese government keeps spending billions of dollars outside our country like on the infrastructure building in developing countries through Belt and Road Initiative. There are different voices in our country about this, uh, although no one questions the political will of the Chinese leadership in moving ahead. So I'd like to have your opinions about how to keep a balance between domestic politics and uh, overseas assistance and investment, because all politics are local, right? Chris? <laughs> well, I think it, again, is what fighting for resources. I mean, similarly in Africa, we have, oh, just coming back to African Union, I mean, when we had, um, 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 when South Africa first was uh, started getting chairing on the African Union, um, I think two or three years back, uh, and now we've been afforded a, a, a UN uh, Security Council seat. It's all about fighting to get there. But once we get there, we find our hands are strong. We don't have much resources here from Africa to do what we envisage to do. I think similar in, in China, obviously China also got a domestic problem where you're going to fight resources, how are we going to juggle our, our enough uh, By the end budget. of the day, I mean, it's an issue of international responsibility as a major rising power on the high region. Do you have high expectations for China in I, terms of its responsibility as I, a major I, uh, and principal stakeholder? Yes, I have high expectations about, about China. Let us look at Chinese development or Chinese rise as a, para, as a global paradigm shift. We cannot run away from that. I'm not, I don't mean that China is becoming a hegemon, a superpower. But this is a paradigm shift that places China at the center. That is the first fact. Now let me uh, say why it's important for China to invest in places like Africa. China needs space to be a global to, to move its business forward. China needs Africa, a peaceful Africa. China needs a real, a, a feasible Africa for business. Because if Africa is not developed, mm -hmm. we're not going to have peace, we're not going to have stability. A place that has got no stability 
it's no place for doing business. But That's number one. Peter, do you think China, it, it is politically correct to call China a new colonialist? It, it's a tough one, and I think it's managing perceptions. But for as long as uh, investment and trade seems to be going in one direction, there's always going to be that perception that one is a big brother and one's a younger brother. And perhaps this is what we need to explore, is what does Africa invest in China? Mm. What does Africa actually export in, in, to, to China beyond raw materials? Until that relationship changes, there's always going to be that perception that big brother is coming in with rules and formats, and that younger brother, because we're in the inferior situation, have to kind of play along and uh, benefit from the benevolence of uh, this great power. Young brothers or old brothers, we are not big brothers. <laughs> uh, we attach so much importance and respect to brotherhood yeah. with Africans. When you ask uh, what Africans have done in China, you have done so much in investing in the co uh, cultivation of friendship and mutual trust between the two continents, between the two sides. I really appreciate your insightful contributions to this meaningful dialogue here in Cape Town against the beautiful table of mountains. Yes. Okay. With, with the enough <laughs> option, viable options on the table. Right. Not the table mountain. <laughs> Thank you again for the participation in this uh, dialogue with Africa. Peter? Young Ray, thanks so much indeed. It's been a pleasure for me to be on the dialogue with uh, the legendary <laughs> Young Ray. Uh, it's been great. And uh, let's continue these conversations, and not just on television, not just at the political level, but when you travel to China, when you travel from China to Africa, talk, share, because only when people on the ground really interact will this project really get off the ground. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, what do I say? Tai Chi. Tai Chi. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you